Floyd for um, more than just a pretty web framework, the Tornado IO event loop. Welcome. So we have a very limited time for this subject because it could go pretty deep. Uh, and I also know I'm standing between you guys and the closing sessions. So it's a unique opportunity to speak and talk about uh, Tornado as a web framework. Uh, has gotten some criticism in the asynchronous world when it came out. Uh, basically, the idea was, well, why write something new? Why write a new async stack? Twisted's out there. It does what it it does, and it's good at doing so. Um, one of the problems, though, is Twisted has a kind of a non quote unquote Pythonic reputation, right? It's complex. Uh, the documentation is a little sparse. And Tornado takes more of a minimalistic approach. And so we'll be talking about kind of the underpinnings of Tornado instead of the web framework stuff that you may have already heard about. But before I do, shameless plug, I'm the chief technology officer for my yearbook. We are, according to Comscore, one of the top 25 most trafficked sites in the US. And that's measured by page views, time spent on site, and minutes per visitor per month. And I'm hiring. And I'm hiring across the board. So DevOps, iOS developers, Android developers, Python developers, PHP developers. And it's a pretty cool place to work. We've been around for about five years. Um, and uh, I really enjoy it. And so hopefully, if anybody's looking, you'll uh, take a look at us. Shameless plug as a sponsor. <laughs> At my yearbook, we use Tornado in multiple different ways, usually for what we consider our high-velocity applications, our non-core web application tools. Uh, and we use it for web apps. We also use it as a communications backend for our Android and iOS app framework uh, for our game platform. And. Um, I've always referred to Tornado as a take-what-you-need web development framework, meaning if you don't like the template engine, don't use it. Use Jinja, use whatever you want to use. Um, and we take that philosophy pretty seriously at my yearbook. We use different aspects and components of Tornado where they make sense, and we don't use others. And when we were evaluating how we were going to write out some of these core apps that were non-web apps, that we were doing heavy async I.O., and we wanted to use the same programmers with the same skill sets that were developing web apps, Tornado was a natural choice for us. Before I get there, um, can I see by a raise of hands how many of you have done async programming in Python? Wow. A lot more than I expected. Very cool. Uh, for those of you that haven't, uh, real basic primer. Um, async network programming typically revolves around an I.O. loop. The I.O. loop is basically the part of the application that registers itself with the operating system and lets the operating system notify it of when it's ready to read, when you can write to it, and if there are errors with regard to sockets. There are multiple styles of I.O. loops uh, depending on your platform and what you're optimizing for. So select is the most basic. Uh, poll is a, is a newer way to deal with that, ePoll on Linux, and KQ on BSD. And uh, async programming is most notably thought of doing callback passing style programming. And that gets a bad rap, right? Everybody thinks callback passing style is complex. But I don't like to think of it that way. I actually think it's fairly straightforward. And this really simplistic example, you can see we're starting. And we're going to call a, a method outside of this example called stuff. And we're going to let it know when you're done doing that, call the next step. And here's the data for you to work. And in the next step, we're going to call more stuff. And when it's done in more stuff, it's going to call the last step. This is the basic principle be behind callback passing style programming and how most async apps are written. So the Tornado I.O. loop is the core of Tornado's network stack. You can use Tornado with WSGI, uh, and there are uh, other ways to invoke different aspects of Tornado. But if you're writing a Tornado application, generally, you're always going to be calling I.O. loop.start. 
Nothing happens really without the I.O. loop. It's fast and it's easy to use. It's a very um, clean set of code. It's one module, very well documented. Um, and you use a single instance per process. You could cram it into a thread. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but basically the idea is, right, you're running one processor, one interpreter with a running I.O. loop. It's cross-platform. Uh, when I say cross-platform, uh, Tornado is explicitly written for uh, Unix systems, right? So you've got Linux, BSD, runs on OS X. It uh, runs on Windows, but it's not supported on Windows by the project officially. And I would encourage you, if you've never gone and looked at the Tornado source code, across the board, it's very readable, it's very well documented, and the I.O. loop, if you've ever wanted to write one and you haven't, go use this as a template as an example, go read what he's doing. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, and the important thing to note about the I.O. loop is it doesn't matter if you're writing a server or a client library, any type of socket communication that you're doing within the application stack, you're using the I.O. loop. Even if you're using classes that are built up on top of the I.O. loop, you're still using the I.O. loop. Now, one of the things that I ran into uh, as the maintainer of the PyCA library, which is the RabbitMQ library, uh, in trying to write an asynchronous core and make it as pluggable as possible. So we have adapters for Tornado, for Twisted. Uh, I wrote a select-based um, asynchronous base as well. Is writing an I.O. loop and tweaking the performance and dealing with all the different aspects, whether it's uh, the simpler parts of reading and writing and dealing with errors or trying to cram SSL support on top of it. And I don't know how many of you have worked with SSL uh, sockets within Python, but it's not necessarily the most straightforward thing. It's not exactly a drop-in replacement for non-SSL communication within Python. Um, you, you can get caught up in the details. And one of the nice things about Tornado is they've developed something called the I.O. stream. And it's a convenient utility class that doesn't sit necessarily as a, don't think of it as something that sits on top of the I.O. stream, or I'm sorry, the I.O. loop. Uh, and as a replacement of that, it actually, when you're writing an application, each connection that you get, or each connection that you create, is an instance, or can be an instance, if you want it to be, of an I.O. stream. And one of the nice things about the I.O. stream is it provides you uh, basically a very top-level layer with a lot of flexibility that does all of the work for you as far as registering with the I.O. loop, uh, reading when it needs to read, uh, giving you the ability to write when you want to write. Um, and this too, like the I.O. loop, is used by both server applications and client applications. So how do you read with I.O. stream? Don't hold the book upside down. Um, you know, the four functions, right? Uh, when I got into writing asynchronous code and writing my own I.O. loop, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, how many bytes do I want to read out of the buffer for the optimal frame size with AMQP, um, and put some thought and time into that, that uh, parsing aspect. And you can see that when they were developing this, um, they thought about that too. This is fundamentally within Tornado's HTTP server, um, what is used to parse incoming HTTP requests and headers. And read until regex is the main function that they use within the HTTP server. So they build out a regex for HTTP request headers, and they call read until regex, passing in the regex and the callback that's going to be called. There's read until, and you can pass in any delimiter that you want read bytes, you know, how many bytes do I want to read? And when I've read that many bytes, um, call back. And one of the nice features is the streaming callback function where it will just pass the bytes to you as things are going. And then once it's hit the limit, it'll stop. And then there's read until close, which is exactly what it says. And like the read in, uh, until bytes, or read bytes, I'm sorry, it will basically just keep reading until that socket closes and pass the data along as it receives it. That works pretty well, but what's going on, right? You're writing an app, you need to know the state of whether you can read, whether you can write, um, or whether the socket is closed. And so there are handy functions for that. 
Now, like I mentioned before, SSL is a little more difficult to work with in Python than it should be. Um, and so what they did was they created SSL IO stream. And if that was there when I f was working on PyCA and adding SSL support, I would have been very happy. Unfortunately, I wasn't. it wasn't. Uh, but it's basically just create an instance of SSL IO stream instead of IO stream. And that when I'm talking about um, the IO loop and I'm talking about IO stream, these aren't necessarily things that you have to, within the Tornado stack, deal with yourself as an async programmer. In fact, uh, if you're writing a server, they've made it really easy. You can just extend tornado.netutil.tcp server, and it does almost everything for you, including wrapping up uh, into the constructor the ability to pass in SSL um, options, and you're good to go. And so here is an example uh, Hello World application, actually an echo server, um, using NetUtil TCP server. And what I've done is I've extended a method called handle stream, which is an empty method within uh, TCP server. And all I'm doing is creating a uh, attribute of my uh, invoked object for the stream so that I can reference it in the other methods. Uh, I tell it to go to the read line function. The read line function uh, reads until it gets a line feed and um, tells it when it's done using callback passing style to call handle read. Handle read writes what has been read back and then calls read line again. And this just runs. And if you look down below the main guard, you see server equals echo server. We're telling it what port to listen on and we're telling the IO loop to start. That's pretty simple for an async server application. Now, you can get a lot more complex. You can uh, fork multiple processes, for example, with this uh, and handle, um, let the main process handle accepting the sockets and pass the connections to sub processes. This is hello world. Now, does this look like async network programming since I have such a wide audience of async network programmers? From a how simple it is perspective? There's a little bit of magic here. Slight magic, as it says in the documentation. There is a module that's relatively new within Tornado called Stack Context. And basically what Stack Context does is it keeps track of the socket connection and handles all of the hard bits for you of associating the context of the socket with the classes and the things that you're using within your entire application stack. And that's how that code gets to be so simple. But you're probably not here for looking at simple code. You want to dive a little deeper, right? How does the Tornado IO loop work? It's actually pretty similar to any other IO loop. You basically have something where you call add handler. You're passing in a file descriptor. The handler uh, or callback function that you want to call when the events are propagating and the events you want to receive. And those events are read, write, and error. Update handler will allow you to update the IO loop and say, hey, I want, only want to read and get errors. I don't want to write right now, so don't let me know when I can write. Or vice versa, add write into your, your IO loop and know when you can write. And remove handler, that should be fairly straightforward. But events, right? What's important about events? If you are writing socket programming without an IO loop and you write and you keep writing and your operating system is not ready for you, it's basically, for whatever reason, built up its entire buffer and you're basically going to be blocked and not be able to write the bytes out that you want to write. So the IO loop, in that case, is letting you know when the operating system is saying, hey, it's okay for you to write. And um, read is basically letting you know when bytes are in the buffer for you to read. And so a example, and I say example in quotes because this is not fully working, of handling the IO loop at the low level looks something like this. You can see that basically if we start down below at the IO loop, we're getting an instance of the IO loop. 
we're creating our file descriptor for our socket. And at this point, we would, for example, if we're writing a client, we're going to connect and, and do all the other things we need to do with the socket before we move on to setting the events that we want to receive notification for. We add the handler to the IO loop. We tell the IO loop to start, and we're on our way. So timers. One of the nicer features in the IO loop is the ability to have timers that fire off, handled for you as it's going through its iterations through events. And so you can pass in with add timeout a deadline. And with a deadline, that can be a epoch, uh, Unix timestamp, or it can be a time delta. And then you pass in a callback, and after that amount of time has expired, or when the deadline hits, that callback is called. And what add timeout does is it passes back to you a reference to that timeout structure within the I.O. loop so that if for whatever reason you don't want that timeout to continue, some event has happened that it's no longer necessary, you can remove it before it's fired. And you can have callbacks. And the idea of the callback on the I.O. loop is just next time the I.O. loop goes through the cycle, call the callback. It's a one shot. It's going to fire. It's going to go away. But it gets a little better. So TCP server is nice from writing uh, async TCP services. But there's a Pythonic simplification that's come out with Tornado 2, which makes it even nicer. Ben Darnell added this, I want to say about six to eight months ago. Um, and that's a module called Tornado Gen. And what Tornado Gen does is allow you to write what I've heard to refer to as more Pythonic code and get rid of callback passing style in writing your async code. And to do that, you just use the Gen Engine decorator and you start writing your code, and you insert yields where you want to yield for your code, and you use gen task to say, here is the function that I want to call, and wait until this returns the value back to me, and continue down the road. Now, one of the things that I remember when Tornado first came out is Glyph had a pretty long blog post about how he was not terribly happy about the Tornado project because all the effort that was put into that could have gone into helping improve Twisted. And so there's been, um, over time, I guess, less bad blood uh, in that area. But somewhere in the last year or so, tornado.platform.twisted appeared. And what tornado.platform.twisted does is it allows you to run any twisted application on the Tornado I.O. loop with the Tornado stack. And I think it underscores what the original point was, which is let's improve one project, right, and uh, add better functionality here instead of writing multiple. Don't do not invented here syndrome, but, but improve for the greater Python community. And what tornado.platform.twisted means to me is basically I have a less intimidating, a less uh, perceptually more complex um, methodology for developing asynchronous applications. And um, I can still use all of those drivers that have been written for the Twisted project and within my Tornado stack. And that's been one of Tornado's shortcomings, whether you're developing on the web side or you're developing uh, on the server side, is driver availability, right? The, the Redis driver, for example, is non-maintained. Um, there's a maintained memcache driver. There's a maintained Postgres driver, maintained MySQL driver. But uh, in the wide range, Tornado lacks a lot of the things that the Twisted project has by the inertia and size of the Twisted project from driver availability. And so from my perspective, tornado.platform.twisted gives me the ability to use those things that were developed for Twisted 
uh, when I'm thinking about tornado. So the important thing for me in developing these applications is thinking about scale. I, I don't develop asynchronous uh, applications because I like asynchronous programming more than non-asynchronous programming. I don't write them because it's hip. Um, I write them because I'm trying to think about how my application is going to scale under heavy load. And so part of that process is to think about how do I take this application on a single machine and make sure it can handle as many requests per second or do as many operations per second as it needs to do? And multiprocessing comes uh, into play here. Uh, Tornado provides a nice framework for kicking off multiple backends, uh, accepting on a single port, and allows you to uh, write these single-threaded async apps that work really well. The important piece in writing these apps, of course, is to look out for resource contention. At what point does a single async process become constrained by CPU compute time in whatever your application is doing, as opposed to waiting on I.O.? And so when your application moves from being in this place where really you're just taking data in and sending data out and doing a lot of time in I.O., you really need to benchmark those parts of your application that will have resource contention. Um, and from that perspective, one of the things that we came across at my yearbook, gosh, I think it was about two years ago, was a hidden part of the multiprocessing library that works really well for us within the uh, Tornado stack that we use. And it is a module that is not documented, but mentioned in a code example towards the bottom of the main multiprocessing document page called multiprocessing reduction. What multiprocessing reduction does is it allows you in one process to pickle the file descriptor of an open socket and pass it to another process within the multiprocessing stack and use it within that other process as if it was in the main one. And that became fundamental for us from an application scaling perspective in how do we handle large amounts of incoming requests and not have resource contention and resource strain amongst all of our processes. And so basically we have a parent controlling process that's doing nothing but uh, taking in open connections, uh, doing the initial authentication uh, that's required to process within the daemon, and then once it passes that step where we have these very long-lived connections, we're passing that file descriptor off to a sub-process, and the sub-process is now responsible for it. And what that code looks like is pretty straightforward and simple. In essence, multiprocessing uh, reduction, you want reduce handle. Uh, H reduce handle is basically pickling the file descriptor from your open socket and using pipes or queues or any of the other constructs within multiprocessing, you're basically able to pass this data around amongst your processes. And uh, in your worker process, you basically get that pickled version of the socket in, you rebuild it, you open it from the file descriptor, and now you have full access to that socket in another process. Pretty powerful paradigm for developing these application sets on the, uh, at least within the same server realm. And uh, knowing that we were coming up against the last of the day uh, and not knowing the audience level, I probably trimmed up a little too much, but are there any questions? This is a pretty vague question, but typically if you have a processor with like N cores and you're trying to maximize um, CPU usage and say you have like plenty of memory and plenty of network. Yes. Do you usually wind up forking N processes? Yes. Or, yeah. Usually we um, tend to uh, put a process per core. And we've played around with CPU affinity and, and you know, we go as far as to bench as much of the app out as we can. And um, depending on the application, sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's probably a good sign and end processes for end query. Exactly. And uh, like I was saying, Tornado has that built in. So you basically uh, can tell it, for example, within the, the TCP server process, uh, fork 
uh, the number of processes that you want to that you have, and it'll automatically go out and figure out how many cores you have and do it all for you. Um, we tend to to like to manually tweak that sort of thing, and so we use that within a setting within our application stack. And this is another vague question, but performance-wise, looking at doing an async HTTP server, say, versus a more you know old old school pre-forking one. You see the same sorts of uh, throughput with a lot less memory usage. Is that part of the hope? Part of it. I mean, the the, the traditional um, per process blocking model is more in line with I have to have as many backends as I need to accept as whatever number of active connections I need to be able to use. The async model allows you to have a little more of a, a of a waiting list. It allows you to to deal with events within your application as the data becomes available. And from uh, an overall application performance perspective, we've absolutely found that it Im improves performance. Because if you're going, for example, and talking to a database, um, there's no reason for you to sit and wait on the database query to come back before you go off and deal with something else for another client connected. Thanks. Yep. Uh, is the Tornado IO loop restartable? Restartable. Like, you all, uh, like Twisted is not. If you st run it, stop it, you cannot start it. Oh, anymore. yes, you absolutely you can. can. All right, yeah. thanks. You're welcome. So I was looking the other day at uh, LibUV, which is the abstraction layer for Node.js, mm -hmm. and there's a PyUV layer on top of that that somebody's working on. Have you heard of any plans to um, basically rebuild Tornado on top of LibUV and use their uh, C++ event handler in place of the Python IO loop? No, but one of the things, and that, that's a good point, um, Tornado comes with, on Linux systems, a C-based ePoll um, module, basically. And so you, you get some performance improvement uh, from that beyond the Python implementation of the ePoll. Uh, so, can you give us a brief uh, architectural overview of your system and how uh, Tornado really helped uh, Sh sure. with that? Sure. So, our primary application stack uh, is a l large PHP application, and overall architecture is, uh, I could probably spend about two hours having a conversation with, but what we found is, you know, that scales well from both a... Um, developer engineering perspective uh, and uh, you know, application development cycle perspective for where we started, but it didn't scale well for us in having to do large volumes of sustained connections from clients over extended periods of time. So if I need to handle um, you know, 40,000, 60,000 long-lived socket connections, um, it wasn't a good platform for us from that perspective. And so an example of where we use uh, Tornado explicitly is we have a, a platform where we have a message bus on the back end that uses RabbitMQ. And we have a front end piece both between our mobile platform side and our web platform side that acts as a communications layer. If you're familiar with uh, Socket.io, Socket.js type of communication where you have a web socket or flash uh, a socket connection down or you do polling type of things with JSON or JSONP, it allows us to communicate with the browser as a uh, persistent uh, connection. And so we push messages up from RabbitMQ up through to the browser or to the mobile phone uh, and we push messages down from the browser or mobile phone down through this process as well. And Tornado works really well for us from that perspective. Uh, in essence, we do more traffic and more volume through this uh, than uh, the rest of our site infrastructure combined on eight servers uh, as opposed to somewhere in the realm on the PHP front of four to 500 servers. Could you share with us uh, what uh, kind of debugging techniques do you use to uh, keep track of the you know, correctness of the event flow conditions in the system overall and so on? Sure. What, uh, so if I got that right, basically how am I debugging state across yeah, the uh, inversion of control, of, you know, how you basically structure your tests and as well if, you know, uh, you can share how 
you can debug a live application sort of. Uh, Sure, so the, the stack context module within Tornado keeps that all together and has an exception um, class built in within it that allows you to catch exceptions within the context of the socket within the application and process based upon that. And so uh, using that helps you from a, a live debugging perspective. Um, it, it may sound overly simplistic, but the logging module is invaluable from a debugging perspective in, in uh, these applications. And what we generally will do is include the file descriptor, the, the information about the process. Uh, and so as the debug messages are coming in, we know the process number that it's running on, we know the, the connection that's running, and we're able to watch the state across all of those. Maybe as a follow-on question, uh, have you found uh, the paradigm shift uh, being difficult to achieve in, you know, basically if you're um, uh, in control of your own programming uh, loop, then, you know, programming conditions and so on, how, what should happen after which event is very different to inversion of control whereby you have to sort of uh, think about these things happening at non-deterministic non times. Um, any sort of techniques that you could uh, share uh, how to sort of one, move from one paradigm to the other? I, I think the, the, you know, moving from, from a synchronous coding style to an asynchronous coding style, I think, uh, and I have to finish up here, uh, but uh, really quickly, uh, the, the gateway drug, at least in the Tornado stack, is the, the gen module because it allows you to at least think in more of a synchronous coding style than an asynchronous coding style. Uh, but the, the bigger thing is keeping track of, as you come into the different methods, uh, if you're using callback passing style, of what's coming in, how it came in, um, and keeping track of it from that perspective. Knowing also, for example, when you're, when you're creating uh, long-lived external, like I'm making an HTTP request or I'm going out to my database server, making sure that you're logging those in a way that you can get that type of feedback in real time with your application so you know that, hey, this connected socket on this process has gone off and issued a query. And if it doesn't come back for 10 seconds and the client's sitting there waiting, you at least know what the last thing is that happened. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin.